Welcome, everybody. So my name is Kimberly Becker, and I'm here with my colleague, Jessica Parker, and we're going to do some AI literacy for educators in the higher ed space. I'll go ahead and give you a list of what we're talking about today before I tell you a little bit more about us. We have about an hour plan, a little less, with some questions. We're hoping to give you a foundational understanding of AI and its applications in higher ed, give you some of the basics of gender Generative AI, that's the kind of AI that we're talking about, including large language models, capabilities of them, limitations, and exploring a practical framework for integrating that into your courses, hopefully, if you're, if you're interested. Yeah, so that we have a few objectives here. And anything that we don't have time to cover, we're happy to come back or we'll have time for question and answer at the end. Oh, I forgot to say this little symbol down here at the bottom, anytime you see that, we'll share these slides with you. And then if you see that, you know, you can click on it and go to it and find out more. Okay, so my name is Kimberly Becker. As Cami said, I'm the doctoral writing consultant for the EDD program at Midland. And I know Jessica because we co-founded a company called Moxie. And I'll let her tell you a little bit about that. But just a little bit about my background is that my degree is in applied linguistics and technology. And so I'm particularly trained in a version of linguistics is called corpus linguistics. It's about big data, analyzing big data sets. And so that's kind of how I got interested in AI. And my research is all about graduate student writing and other kinds of disciplinary academic writing, kind of what, what the differences are between disciplines, genres, and levels as, as people go along their trajectory. Jessica, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Parker. I wear a lot of hats. I teach, I supervise doctoral students at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Before 2017, I was predominantly a healthcare researcher and faculty member up in Boston at Northeastern University and Harvard School of Dental Medicine. I then left higher ed full time and started um, an academic consulting company where we partner with universities to support their doctoral students. And ultimately, that's how I first met Kimberly as I hired her to come on and work with me. And then ultimately, we ended up founding Moxie together. I'm really passionate about supporting emerging researchers. I work probably worked with at least two to 3,000 emerging researchers at this point across various disciplines. And I am a generative AI researcher. Kimberly and I conduct generative AI research to help us better understand the capabilities and limitations of this technology so that we can learn how to ethically and responsibly integrate it into our work with our students. Thanks. All right. Many of the ideas that we'll talk about in this presentation come from a researcher named Lance Eaton. He has a blog called AI and Education Simplified, so I encourage you to check out that substack for other, all, all sorts of good stuff there. And But this, this presentation in particular, we got some help from him because neither of us work with undergrads and we knew that this audience, my understanding is most of you do teach undergrads. And so we wanted to make sure that we were bringing in some materials and sources that really speak to you and what you do. So I highly encourage you to check out that blog. I'm going to start with a poll and Jessica, can you do the poll? Ah, there we go. Just about how open you are to AI. We just don't know kind of whenever we do this, we never know where people are. Some people are very, very concerned about it. Other people are already implementing it. So there's a large spectrum. We got yeah. Good. Great. Looks like most of you are pretty open, very open. Good. Okay. That's good to know. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop that and share the results. So you can see everybody was a was a two or a three. So that's actually not the norm, but great. That's great. <laughs> so here's the, here's kind of where, where we're starting from. If you ask 10 faculty, you know, what do they think about AI? Um, well, first of all, you usually notice there's like a palpable tension surrounding the topic. There's, we want to approach this with care and understanding. If you ask 10 people, you'd probably get 30 different perspectives. If you asked them again in 20 minutes, you'd get 50 new ones. So we're seeing a wide range of reactions. 
Some people are already deeply integrating it. Other people are concerned. Some are grappling with the very existence of the technology and having kind of an existential crisis or at least acknowledging the complexity. Um, generative AI is multifaceted. And of course, it's stirring up a diverse array of emotions and opinions. So as we move forward, you know, we just want to acknowledge that whoever is here, you, you probably are coming from a different position, all of you, and your voice is welcome and we want to be inclusive. But as, as you know, we, we do, we are supporters of generative AI from a, as long as we have a critical standpoint. And we'll tell you about that a little bit more as we go along. So first of all, this is supposed to be a fun poll. What is generative AI? And we want wrong answers only. So basically, we're asking you, what are the things that you might have heard about generative AI that you know are wrong, that you know are kind of myths or not quite right? And this is anonymous, so don't be afraid. Yeah, it is totally anonymous. <laughs> okay, we have two responses so far. Just a short answer is fine. I didn't even think about what I would say for this question. I think I would probably say it's a magic box that provides answers all of your life's to all of your life's questions. I actually share a chat GPT account with my 20 year old who's in college right now. And that is a world of education. Let me just tell you. We've got about half the folks. Do you want to end the poll? Where are the answers? Do you see them? Let me see if I can find it and I'll bring it up. You keep going and I'll bring it up. Okay. Answer. Yeah. I can't see any of it. Okay. Well, if you're just joining us, welcome. And we just were ha we had a kind of a fun poll. What is generative AI? Wrong answers only. And now we're going to give you our idea of what generative AI is. And this is from the perspective of two people who are not computer scientists. I have had some training in natural language processing. Neither Jessica nor I are AI experts. We call ourselves AI enthusiasts. We are self-taught for the most part. But this slide kind of shows you the relationship between these different levels of artificial intelligence and various types of, I guess, aspects of them it is a very broad term. People are throwing it around. And basically what they mean when they talk about AI is all the way down in that very smallest box, which is LLMs or large language models, which is a form of generative AI. But we have machine learning and deep learning also in there. We have a YouTube channel where we go into depth of all of these. I have a little dog training analogy that I do. We'll share that with you so that you, if you want to know more, you can. But the point is that a large language model, which is like ChatGPT, is a specific type of generative AI that primarily focuses on text-based tasks, but it can also generate images. Today, we're mostly talking just about text. Images, audio, video, all of that. Multimodal AI is kind of what everybody is talking about now. And there are lots of AIs that you can just get on your phone, like ChatGPT and Claude both have a widget that you can get on your iPhone and you can just talk directly to it just like you do Siri. So this multimodal is really wonderful for accessibility, but primarily today we're focused on kind of the text-based. And when we say a large language model, there's three pieces to a large language model. And this really helped me to understand it when I learned this. So of course there's the data, which is just like, petabytes of information, lots and lots of information. And then there is the architecture that is built in. And the architecture, if you if you look at what GPT stands for, Generative Pre-trained Transformer, is that transformer architecture that is a kind of deep learning that really changed this technology because previous models could only process one word after another after another, but transformers can look at an entire sentence all at once in context and they can determine which parts are most important and then they can output a better result based on that longer context. And then of course the third part is training. And so that is machine learning training plus there's a human element to that as well. And we'll, we'll get more into this as we go along. The data itself is basically the whole web, all websites, Wikipedia blogs, they scraped the, the whole web of English. And then there's books, articles, databases, anything that's open source, and maybe some things that aren't, not really sure. Social media posts, of course. And more, business documents, white papers, educational materials, legal texts, dialogues, transcripts, advertising, I mean, on and on and on and on, a lot of stuff in there. 
That's why some people call it a black box, because we don't really know exactly what's in there. And we also don't really know how language models arrive at the specific conclusions that they output because we cannot pinpoint their thought processes. But we know that what they're not doing is going in and getting a, a source, harvesting that source and then outputting it exactly. That's not what they're doing. It's all mixed up in there. They're recognizing patterns and then they're outputting those patterns in a predictive model. So it's really just a mathematical model of communication. And the and the phrase that I really like right now is a word calculator or a, a language calculator. And the way the calculator works is that it, it basically just predicts the next word based on context. So if you start with a sentence like, the color of the sky is blank, the model is going to go into its data and it's going to predict what's the most likely word. And if all we have is the color of the sky, it's probably going to be blue. However, if we have a little more context, like it's raining, now the color of the sky is, it's much more likely going to be something like gray or dark or another adjective. So really, it's just a predictive model. And that's why we say it's kind of a calculator of language. The training process, I hinted at this a little bit, but there's supervised learning where the machine model is trained on labeled data, like these are fruits, this is an orange, this is an apple, and again and again and again, repetitive training. That's why I use the dog training model in some of my other webinars. And then after the machine is trained that way, there's reinforcement learning from human feedback that really is what makes the model sound human-like because a human has sort of approved of enough of the patterns it's generated before to give it some kind of a feeling that it's human generated, even though it's absolutely not. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jessica to talk about some popular AI tools. All right. Thanks, Kimberly. So I'll just start by saying there are a lot of tools out there. Kimberly and I just today were talking about how it feels impossible to keep up, how we struggle to make recommendations to our students because A, like we don't know what tools are going to be here a year from now. We don't know which of these free tools are going to suddenly implement a pricing model. And even how some of these tools are being marketed is quite confusing. So we're just really skimming the surface and we're categorizing these tools for you instead of really diving deep into specific individual tools. When we talk about these tools, think you can think of these as application layers. So on the left side of the screen is just a direct human to interaction with a large language model. And that's the logo for ChatGPT. So if you want to go right to a large language model like ChatGPT or Claude, then that's there's no application layer there. But when you interact with a lot of these AI tools that are coming out, like Google's Notebook LM that just came out, or Google has Illuminate now, Kimberly and I were just playing around with that earlier, you're interacting with an application layer that a company has built that in, is between you and the large language model. And typically this is because the, the large language model needs to be used for a very specific use case. When I talk to my students about this, I try to help them understand that just the term generative AI is too general. It, it doesn't really capture what the tool does. All of these tools have different purposes. They're pulling um, information from different models and different databases, and they're not all the same. And that can be quite confusing for folks. And I think the easiest way to think about it is it's an application layer. So many of what these tools we talk about right here are application layers. They're powered by large language models, whether it be ChatGPT or Claude or Gemini. Like Google's research tools, Notebook, LM, Illuminate are powered by Gemini, its large language model. But we have all these different tools out there, like writing tools such as Grammarly now has generative AI features, Quillbot, PaperPal, Jenny AI, these literature discovery tools like Site, Consensus, LitMaps, there's way more. They all have some sort of large language model on the back end that they're leveraging to complete whatever the specific task the tool was created for. And it's really important for us to understand that and for our students to understand that because all these tools are not created equal and they're not all built for the same tasks. I remember thinking it was interesting, like I, I came across something on LinkedIn and someone was telling me how they were using perplexity for writing. And, and I thought that was 
strange because I don't ever use it for writing and it can do that, but that's not really what it was made for. So understanding the purpose of these tools, what that application layer was created to do is important so that you know you're leveraging it in the right way to get the most effective or high quality output. We're also seeing a lot of AI detectors and even tools that are made to humanize AI generated content. So it can't be detected by an AI detector. I, I can't even emphasize like how unreliable these tools are. I'm going to give you some examples in a moment. They are completely unreliable. I, I tell my students to stay away from them, but they are being heavily marketed to our students on social media. Kimberly and I, we believe like when a, a student comes to us or even a faculty member comes to us about an AI detector, we don't like to say you're wrong for using it. We think it's just a sign of low AI literacy right now. I think a year from now, we'll look back and we'll realize how silly it was to try to use AI to detect AI. So I'm gonna give you some examples. Well, first I'll talk to you about how it works and then I'll show you some examples. So when we think about how these AI detectors work, there's human generated input that's going into a large language model. So that middle piece is the large language model and the large language model is producing human-like output. So you're prompting the large language model and it produces output that mimics human language, things that human can do. Can do. And for this reason, when you think about just the basics of how large language models work, this AI generated content, then I think it makes sense to think about why these AI detectors are unreliable because they're trained on human-like data to produce human-like data, even though it's an AI model. So these AI detectors, all they're doing is taking whatever input you give it, it's running it through its own backend LLM and algorithm, and it's basically asking itself a really simple question. Is this text similar to what I would write, like the large language model? Is it predictable? There's actual precise measures of this that we won't have to get into today, but it then just generates a score. Like if, if the input that the human provides, whether it's human generated or AI generated, it just asks using an algorithm, is this similar to what I would produce? And if it's very predictable, then it considers it AI generated. If it's not predictable, then it considers it human generated. And then it produces a score. So let's look at what this looks like in practice. So I tested several different AI detectors. This is an article I wrote back in 2018 before generative AI existed, 100% human AI, human written. And I fed it into an AI detector. You can go to the next slide, Kimberly. And so I'm gonna point out a few things. I, on the left side, it says 131 words. So I just took a portion, 131 words of that article and it said it was 100% AI generated. I then just added a bit more text. I added the entire abstract and then it changed. It said it was 47% AI generated. And one thing I want you to notice is that it was wrong. It was 100% human generated. But there's also something interesting about AI detectors in that its score changes based on the number of words you're giving it. And it, it tends to get it more correct, if you will, even though they're unreliable, the more words it has. And so just giving it a little bit more text can change that score, even though it's the same author. And for this reason, we believe strongly that faculty and students need to develop certain AI literacies. And Kimberly and I worked on a white paper where we're sort of laying out these AI literacies for higher education faculty and students. And we've categorized them into functional, critical, and rhetorical. And they're based off of an existing digital literacies framework. I'm gonna hand it back over to Kimberly because she was really instrumental in developing this framework given that she is a linguist. Kimberly, you're still muted, yeah. Okay, yeah, so as Jessica said, this is not, anything really new it this we feel that ai literacy is an extension of di digital literacy which could be problematic because people already have low digital literacy and so adding on to it is scary and really really overwhelming but basically there we think of ai literacy as having three levels the first of which is functional, which is basically just understanding the tools kind of under the hood. Essentially, all the things that we just told you, it's a predictive algorithm, you know, it's human, it's human like text, it's not propagating, it's not harvesting exact words, it's pattern oriented, and just understanding the limitations and the potential of it from that perspective. And then once you have a basic functional understanding, can expand that and start thinking critically about it. And this is where it's really important to work with students to make sure that they 
understand that the accuracy and the reliability is variable and that they need to be assessing the quality and relevance of these sources or this output that comes from the AI and considering what the ethical options are for the choices they're making about which AI to use and the biases. And so this is just critical thinking, but it's critical thinking specifically about AI. And you can't really do that if you don't have a functional understanding. And then the largest piece of the framework, the circle, is rhetorical or sometimes I just say communicative because people, the word rhetorical kind of gets, I think, lost. But basically, we're just talking about using what you're doing with AI to communicate, to like take it to the next level in the real world, which is what matters um, so that you can accomplish some sort of communicative goal and that you can basically start to understand what the differences are between human generated and AI generated content. So that's a basic overview of that. I think I'm going to skip this poll just because of time and also because we seem to be confused about how polls work in Zoom. But these are some ways you can start thinking about how to use generative AI in your classroom or as you develop materials. And what we've done is divide these into kind of buckets, categories, brainstorming and efficiency, content generation, data processing or information processing and communication tasks. And we're going to give you some sample prompts and some suggested tools that you can use to do these pretty common tasks that a faculty member might, might need to do. The first category is efficiency and brainstorming. So this is really kind of automating some routine tasks that may consume your time, but really add little intrinsic value. And, and you probably don't get a whole lot of, you probably don't feel Worse about yourself if you automate these, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So examples include scheduling, generating lists, or like initial idea generation. And here's a couple of prompts that work really well with pretty much any language model. They're all capable of doing this kind of thing. But I know one thing that when I was teaching was annoying every semester was changing all those dates in my syllabus. Having to get from, you know, if I was teaching on a Tuesday, Thursday, shifting it to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever I'm, I'm doing. Getting dates and times correct is hard for me, and that's something I can automate. Also, the list of holidays. So, and and then these prompts, what you'll notice is that they end with a an example. So here's the prompt, provide a verified list, list them like this, so that you know what you're going to get out of the machine. The machine is more likely to give you what you want if you give it an example. That's called a one-shot prompt, but shot just means example. And the tool that I recommend for this, and if you're not familiar with Perplexity, I highly recommend that you check it out because Perplexity is connected to some data sources that are really important. And this matters because it's not, it's less likely to hallucinate, I guess I should say. It's still possible for these tools to hallucinate, but it's less likely because they have on the back end some options. So if you're in Perplexity, there's a search box, just like in, you know, a context window like in every other tool, but there's a little focus button down here. And if you click that focus button, this other window opens up and then you have choices. You can search across the entire internet. You can limit it to academic for published papers. Now, the caveat here is that this uses Semantic Scholar and Semantic Scholar's database is heavily skewed biomedical sciences. So if you're in the humanities, it's not going to be as it's not going to work as well for you because the corpus it's on the back end of it the database is more in the biomedical kind of area it can do some basic math or it can just generate writing like you do with any other model video so i believe this is connected to youtube and social and i this one is connected to reddit as far as i know so i could see this being really helpful for you know if you're doing a certain kind of research and you want to know kind of what the general population is thinking versus what, you know, an academic source might say versus what something just on the web might find, like demographic information for a grant proposal or something like that. So I think this is great for students and faculty. This is what happened when I used those prompts with perplexity. It generated the Tuesdays between August and December of this year, as I requested in the format I requested. And then here's the list of holidays. And so what you'll notice here is that each of these has a tiny little kind of footnote like number that is connected to a web source. And if you wanted to know where perplexity got that information, you could click on that number and it would take you then to a link 
to a website. So this is really important AI literacy. And this is something that I show my college student son all the time so that he can verify where this information is coming from. Because, you know, with ChatGPT, you just don't get that kind of transparency. Okay, category two is content creation. This is probably what you have heard about a lot with generative AI, creating an assignment or troubleshooting an assignment. And so we think about students using it to generate an essay. And of course, we all think that's unethical and is not, you know, is violating the, the com commonly accepted norms of academic integrity. But I do think it's just fine for faculty to use it to draft an assignment prompt because of the time-saving effect and the ability for you to then build on that. So for example, draft an assignment for a 2000 word essay, this topic, and create the objectives, write a set of guidelines, provide the students a checklist and give me a rubric, out put the rubric in a table format using a zero to 10 scale. So, you know, that doesn't take long at all to do. And then you already have kind of the working skeleton of the assignment that you can go and build on. Another thing that is really helpful is to troubleshoot an assignment. So to think ahead, maybe this is a new class you're teaching and you're not sure what students are going to have difficulty with because you never taught it before. So you try to get the AI to act as a kind of troubleshooter and to think through what questions students might have, what's missing, what's confusing, what could be improved and use it like a uh, interview style to act as a student and sort of poke holes in anything that you may have overlooked in that assignment. You can use ChatGPT, I mean, you can use any of the tools for this, but I think with something like this and basic, basic content generation, ChatGPT is probably the go-to source. All of these tools that we're showing you, by the way, are free up to a certain point. Of course, if you want to use it heavily, then you'll, you'll have to pay for it, but they all have a free version. Category three is data and information processing. So this is when you assist in, when you get the LLM to assist you in summarizing or translating or maybe extracting key information from some large data set or document. It's useful if you're writing a literature review or synthesizing research. Of course, lots of people are using, this use case is very, very popular. Be careful though. I recently realized that there is a link, there's a very nuanced linguistic difference between words we use to talk about correlation versus words we use to talk about causation. And of course, this is a big part of making a logical argument in, in, in scientific writing. So just be careful for that because it's, it's tricky. And I, and I just, I always like to, to throw that caveat in. The second prompt, and this is something that I have used a lot to get ideas about how to visualize my data if I'm doing research, or even when I was teaching, I was using it to take the, like the grade distributions. If I had a test and I had the distribution of grades, I would always show that to my students so that they knew kind of, okay, where am I in the, in the world of the class? And, oh, everybody did a little bit, you know, worse on this than the previous and and just getting some ideas about how to visualize data because that's that's very that increases our communicative abilities when we can provide visual input and so it's not necessarily that the LLM is giving me the actual visualization chart graph table whatever but it's giving me ideas for a, a visual that I'm going to generate with my own program later. And then for communication tasks, the suggestions are drafting like a bulk student email. Let's say you have an exam coming up, you might include the topics in the exam, maybe some study tips, have an LLM output a draft of that email that you could then adapt for, for with your own style. And this is one, this is my favorite one for emails. And so even, even if I'm not feeling like my tone is snarky, sometimes I want to be more polite than my, I guess, default setting would be. Because as you know, email, text, anything where there's not like a human interaction, tone can get lost. And so I have found that when I put anything I'm questioning into an LLM and I say, can you revise this for clarity and politeness to ensure, for example, an encouraging tone while still emphasizing like this is this is a big deal, then I have much clearer communications for interpersonal interactions like email. 
So this is like my favorite use case right now. And I use Claude for almost everything. Claude is my favorite LLM. I think it's Jessica's favorite LLM. I, I actually think it's better than ChatGPT right now. It's a better writer. It sounds more authentic to me, but it's a personal choice. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Jessica. Thanks, Kimberly. Yeah, so we're going to talk about, those are some different categories of how you might leverage these tools. We're now going to go into some specific tools that we regularly use that you might not be aware of, and hopefully you'll find them helpful. We're going to start with Gamma. It's a tool that we use frequently for generating PowerPoints. I have a keynote next week. I wrote my keynote in a Word document. I uploaded it to Gamma and it does start free. I mean, there does, to some extent, you'll end up having to pay, like if you keep going through iterations, but it's crazy how much it has changed. I used Gamma very early on and I was not impressed. I did not like it and I set it to the side. Now it has improved so much, which just shows like how much this technology has evolved and advanced. You put in your text, you can choose some different themes like this keynote I'm doing needs to be very professional. It's not supposed to be fun or whimsical. And so you get to choose your theme. And then it outputs uh, a really nice looking PowerPoint. I still have to do something with it. I st I'm still going to edit it. Sometimes I'm not a huge fan of the images, but it saves me a lot of that initial time. And so if you don't enjoy creating PowerPoints, this is definitely a tool that you could use that can help save you time and just get you started. Especially if you don't like designing PowerPoints, it immediately gives you some visual, some visuals that you can just immediately add to those slides. Notebook LM, this is new. Uh, you may have heard about this. There's been a lot of uh, chatter about Notebook LM. This is Google's latest tool for education. It is an, an experimental beta mode right now. Kimberly and I have been playing around with it. And what's really nice is they think of it as a virtual notebook that is powered by a large language model. In this case, it's Gemini. There's a lot of things it can do. I highly recommend just checking it out and watching the demo. When you think about it, I'll first talk about how I would use it as a faculty member and researcher, and then about how your students could use it. So you could upload, like as a researcher, if I'm doing a lit review, I could upload all of my PDFs on a specific topic that I'm conducting my literature review on. And then I can have a conversation with all of those PDFs at once. It could, it'll take up to 20 documents, up to 4,000 words each, I think, or maybe it's 40,000 words each. And it'll pull directly from those sources and then it'll then cite, it'll take you exactly to that document where the information came from so you can double check where it's pulling information, which is great. It's very time saving. I do think from the perspective of like experts versus students, I tend to differentiate use cases in that way. I just had a conversation with one of my students this week who was making a pretty bold claim in her research about a current issue. And she was using a citation from 2014. And so is Notebook LM going to solve that problem? No, I mean, it's going to work with whatever you give it. From an expert perspective, it's a lot easier for us to identify like what those issues might be versus a student. And so that's where I think it really depends on what is the level of the student? What are you teaching? And what are the learning outcomes? But for students, they could upload like all of the course materials for one class and they could interact with those course materials and query it in Notebook LM. They can create different projects related to those course materials and organize notes. It is really quite amazing. And so I definitely recommend checking that out and thinking about how either you can leverage it or how you might want to expose your students to it. There's also Illuminate. This is also by Google. This will take a text document and turn it into an audio summary or a podcast. So it creates these interactive audio discussions. You can choose the voice. So for these, if you're an auditory learner or if your students are auditory learners, this can be incredible for them taking written course materials or documents. I know for myself, like I, it's a lot, it's difficult for me to find time to read as much as I'd like, but I do go on a lot of walks. And so the idea of being able to turn research articles that I would normally be reading into an audio podcast, not only just makes it more interesting, but for auditory learners, this is how we're starting to get to these like personalized learning pathways, which is really fascinating. And so with these in mind, or I think Kimberly, did you want to take over here? Or is this where I go into the framework? Oh, this is where I go into the framework. Okay, I'll keep going. So you might, if you're overwhelmed, this is a simple question that I would ask you to ask yourself. When we often talk to faculty, 
Typically they see all these options available and they just shut down. And we have a simple question that we like to ask before we sort of go into the conversation of, does it make sense for you to use AI in this way? And it's really understanding when it's appropriate to, we say, throw technology at a problem. So if you think of a specific pain point that you have, and you're wondering if it's appropriate to use AI, we think you should consider using AI if you cannot humanly scale that solution. So for instance, it's impossible to scale timely, high quality feedback. It's impossible to scale my time and my resources. It's impossible for me to have the time to give each of my students personalized learning materials based on, in my context, the research topics are all different. And so when I think about different pain points I have in my classes, and when I'm trying to determine if it makes sense to use AI, I ask myself this question. And then the way we do it is very incremental and sustainable. I'm going to walk you through this very basic framework now with an example of how I first started using AI in my classes. But first is identifying a problem. So instead of thinking about transforming an entire course, what is just a one very specific teaching and learning pain point? And then thinking about, should AI be a solution? It could be, but not always. Then this really important component of the framework is the human aspects. Like what could be the impact of this using AI as a solution on students or yourself, teachers? Then start small, maybe with one class, or you could do a small experimental study if it's low stakes with half the class. And then you're reflecting and you're iterating. So this is very much like an action research framework, but it's very specific to AI integration. I'm gonna walk you through an example. This is a problem that I have in my class. I teach doctoral students. I have 26 students. They're from probably 11 different health professions. They're all getting a terminal degree and their research topics are all very different. So it's not like I'm just teaching nursing students and I need to be a content expert on nursing. I have acupuncturists, physical therapists, pharmacists, osteopathic doc doctors. Uh, I have one student who's studying supply chains and Bitcoin, and I, I don't understand that topic. And so being able to provide some individualized feedback on these long papers based on their specific research topic is something that I've always struggled with. And so that was a pain point I immediately thought, like, could AI help me with this in some way? So before I just jumped in and used AI, I thought through like, what can AI do in this scenario? Well, I know that it's capable of giving some initial feedback based on criteria you provide it. It is good at highlighting potential areas for improvement. It's not always 100% accurate, but it's good enough, especially if the, the alternative is zero. It can generate questions to prompt deeper, deeper thinking, and it can do a lot of the things that I feel like I would want to do if I could just replicate myself and be available at any time for my students when they want my feedback. And so I immediately thought AI could be a solution. Then the other component of that is can I scale the solution with human resources? And in this case, the reason I started using AI was this immediate feedback issue. And I thought like, no, I can't scale my time and my resources. I can't just bring on teaching assistants. And so I felt that AI was a really strong contender for potentially solving this pain point. Then I thought about my impact on students. And this is what I'm still learning. I'm now on my fourth semester of using AI chatbots for formative feedback. And things that I would think about that I would encourage you to think about is like, what am I complementing or replacing? How is this going to change my role? How might the students perceive the shift in my role? And this is going to be different based on your discipline, based on what the students are learning, the learning objectives, and sometimes based on the stakes. I like to think of things in terms of like low stakes and high stakes. And then how can it also maybe potentially help me? So those are those human aspects that are very critical, we believe, to this process. And then starting small. I originally started with eight students. I met with them throughout the semester, I had them reflect and do self-assessments that were ungraded, but it was an extra component that I added to their work. I started with AI literacy, just exposing them to the tools they would be using, making sure they knew how to use them. It was very gradual. And I started with low stakes task. I actually just published a study on that experience that first semester with my students and that gradual integration. We use like Bloom's taxonomy to think about going through like knowledge to application. And we started with low stakes task and that worked really well. And so I've really continued to stick to that. But again, I started small, not only with a small group of students, but I didn't look at all of my classes. I just did one class. 
And then I reflected and iterated. And we do this as instructors all the time, regardless of if we're integrating a new technology or not, is we're thinking about what are the student experiences, what are those outcomes, and how can we make improvements? And that's no different in this situation. Kimberly, do you want to jump into this, these examples? She shared this incredible article with me today, and we added this in last minute. Yeah, we just added this. So there's a website, it's linked down here at the bottom. It's called Writing Commons, and it walks through eight different creative assignments that a student, that any any undergraduate class could do. I mean, I would argue you could use this at any level, but it basically goes through a series of ways to get students thinking about thinking critically. So getting beyond just how does AI work, but like really digging deep into these issues that revolve around ethical topics like plagiarism, pl post-plagiarism, academic integrity, U.S. copyright, privacy, deep fakes, all of these things that you hear about in the news. These are buzzwords. You know, students may not even know what they mean. And so just introducing them to these terms first and allowing them to really get into it creatively and explore it can help them to develop that critical literacy. So yeah, th this is all examples. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to sort of blow through this pretty quickly, but I highly encourage you to look at this website because it really, and like I said, we just found it. So we, we're we still kind of sorting through what it, what it all means. One of the things that I really, really like about this website, and, it, and it's by a professor of rhetoric. My background is in linguistics, but I was always in an English department with the rhetoricians and many times thought we, it, I love the, the work of rhetoricians and linguists together. But all of us for, for years and years and years, writing instructors have been talking about process over product. And even if you're not a writing instructor, probably writing is in some sort of evaluation that you do, whether it's just a little bit or a lot. And the, the creator of this website talks a lot about Kairos driven prompts. So focusing really on like a contextual situation, a, a place, a time where something is happening and then emphasizing the actual process of putting something together rather than grading the product. And he talks about how he grades and how he uses this process to prioritize what the students are doing on an everyday basis rather than the final deliverable. And so this is just an example of some key features of Kairos driven prompts. These can be prompts for the student as in prompts like assignment directions or instructions, or these could be prompts that the students are using with the chatbot. Building custom chatbots is one of the things that he suggests. And although you might think this is way above your head, I can tell you that people are doing this all the time. They're building custom GPTs to perform and automate a number of tasks. And so this is a project that you might be able to kind of do with your students in a way that where everybody is kind of on an equal playing field, especially if you're learning this. There's a platform called Poe AI where you can create bots for free and you don't need any coding or extensive technical expertise. They're, they can be used for a lot of different purposes and it gives students kind of that real world um, knowledge about what, what they're going to face when they get out into the workplace. Because employers are wanting people to know, what can AI do? People ask me that all the time. What can I do with AI in my business? And, you know, I'm, I have so many ideas. Where do you even start? But you have to play with it first. And this issue of deep fakes and misinformation, this is something that, I mean, if you've ever taught any sort of information literacy, librarians are always preaching this, understanding misinformation and disinformation and, and sort of what what separates those two, especially right now during a presidential campaign year. This is really important for students to start understanding how AI can increase this problem that we already have. Yesterday, I made a deep fake of myself in 30 minutes for free using a program called HeyGen. And so I just uploaded a, I uploaded a five minute video of me and I uploaded a script and it somehow put those things together 
and it created this. And I sent it to my family and they were like, that doesn't sound like you. It doesn't have a Southern accent. So it sounded a little bit too news anchory. It didn't really sound like me, but it was me talking and the words seemed to be coming out of my mouth. So it's, it's really easy to do this. And I think we need to be talking about it. Okay. So just wrapping up here, a couple of universal truths to think about. The first one is a lot of faculty are taking an abstinence stance for avoiding generative AI or any AI. And, and so our belief is abstinence is not a strategy. Abstinence is not sustainable. It doesn't really benefit anybody except a a faculty member, a teacher who doesn't want to change anything. Historical examples show us that prohibition didn't work. The war on drugs, abstinence only sex education. I mean, we have a lot of examples that show this kind of don't do this no matter what tends to increase the curiosity about it. And students are already using this. We know this. So it's not a it's not really a strategy. It's not, um, it can be your policy, but it's just not exactly beneficial. And then the two bucket challenge. And again, this comes from Lance Eaton and I love this. So he says the two bucket challenge, and these are leaky buckets because it's a continual process, is that you need two types of knowledge to really successfully implement AI in your classroom. And the first one is AI literacy. And we had, we showed you a framework for that. And the second one is content knowledge, discipline-specific content knowledge. And so if students don't have that yet because they're not experts, then, th then you need to be talking about that. How can you verify whatever you're getting, whatever information you're getting, using your AI literacy to confirm or correct that information that comes out of the chatbot? So that's the kind of two-bucket challenge. And then the last universal truth is find some sort of aha moment where you have and discover a personal use case that really adds value and think about effectiveness, not just efficiency, because I think we're being sold kind of a false line of, you know, we hear about AI as this efficiency, this way to be more productive faster. And I'm not sure that's the case. When we have a new technology, we have to learn it. So I think if you can find something that really helps you improve your effectiveness in something like my example of the simple, the email, you know, making my emails more polite. That's really important to me to come across and to be as polite as, as I can be, even when I'm tired, especially when it's in writing. But yeah, so find your aha moment and then share that with somebody so that you can have this open, transparent dialogue about it. And so that you can negotiate what is happening in, in this new, world and sort of learn from each other. And that, you know, having that aha moment really can give you empathy for a student who may think they have an aha moment with using AI, but really they're kind of misguided. And, and you can help them understand it when you have a good use case yourself. And that is all we have. We'd love to open it up now for any questions or comments. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you all. I did share a few links in the chat. I shared the link to that Writing Commons website. I also shared a link to, which had all of those examples Kimberly really talked about at the end. We just, like I said, discovered that today and thought it was just a treasure trove of really good practical examples. And then we have an AI literacies uh, framework white paper in case you're interested in that. Uh, I also linked to that. I see a question about Claude. Insight for Claude. So here, here's a little insight about Claude. The founders of Claude were working for OpenAI and decided that they didn't like their practices. As you know, OpenAI often has a lot of drama. And so they left and they founded their own company and they named their product Claude because Claude is the name of a very famous AI researcher from many, many years ago. And so Claude is known as the helpful, harmless AI. That's their sort of byline. And Claude will, okay, Claude is more likely to tell you if it doesn't know. It will often say, I don't have any information about that. 
Alternately, it will also just make it up. But it seems to be more careful, but it's sourced from all those same, you know, I showed you that list of like websites, blogs, Wikipedia, YouTube, uh, all those the same things that all the large language models have. They all have some of those same things in them. It's not any different in that sense. It's a brand name, basically. I, I usually teach this and I say a large language model is like a box of tissues. They're not all Kleenex. You know, we have Chat GPT, we have Claude, we have Gemini, we have Law, we have a lot of different ones. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Jessica. Prompts. I'm just going to say Claude 3.5 Sonnet has performed really well on benchmarks. Whenever a new version comes out or a new language model comes out, we have, there's some standard benchmarks that we look at. And it does depend on the use case, I'll, I'll say. Like Gemini has sort of made a name for being better at data analysis. Although when you really look at the fine print, you know, sometimes you have to give eight examples to reach the, the level of accuracy that they advertise, which would be challenging if you don't know how to do those mathematical calculations to begin with. But Cloud 3.5 Sonnet has consistently performed really well on all the benchmarks that are important for our use cases. And so I think it's important for us to do a little bit of digging, think about what you're using it for, because you might not need a premium version, like GPT-4 Omni might be good enough for what you're using it for, but because we do research and it's pretty high stakes, we tend to pay for a premium version and we want to use the top models based on the benchmarks for our use cases. There was a question about learning how to do prompting. Yeah, we have we have a YouTube video about that. There's like about four types of prompts. Once you learn kind of the pattern, I think you you'll you'll pick it up really quickly. It basically has to do with how many examples you give it. So it's things like if it, if it's a zero shot prompt, that means you ask it for something and you don't give it any examples. I don't know why they named these things zero shot, one shot, few shot, but shot just means example. So if you give it no examples, it's a zero shot prompt. If you give it one example, it's a one shot prompt. If you give it a few, it's a few shot prompt. So that's what Jessica was saying. Sometimes they'll give it like eight examples and they'll get these really high scores like, oh, it's doing like a fourth year PhD student in mechanical engineering. Well, that's with eight examples. <laughs> so the prompt becomes really, really long in that case. Of course, that's going to increase the chance that you get better output. And then there's something called chain of thought prompting where you go step by step by step. So I think teachers are really well positioned to do good prompting and get better results because we are used to explaining things. And so you know how you have to go step by step and you do baby steps and you do increments. Well, it's the same with a large language model. So that's a really brief overview, but we do have a, I can try to find a YouTube. We're almost, at, oh, we are at time. Yeah. So I want to be. Thank you so much to share. All right. Well, that is all. Thank you for joining us. I feel like that hour went by fast. We threw a lot of information at you, but we'll share the slides and the links to the resources. Bye everyone.